thank you all for coming out to the old state house on a snowy day and you're um, being intrepid uh, New Englanders. My name is Rebecca Tabor Conover. I am head of public programs here at the old state house and I'm delighted to see you for another of our conversations at noon programs. Um, as we get started, uh, I just wanted to mention to you that we will be having a program in just a couple of weeks on February the 24th. This is a program we had to reschedule due to, surprisingly, snow in January, and it's um, called To Protest or Not to Protest, Activist Lessons from the Life of William Sloan Coffin, Jr., and that's going to be co-sponsored with our friends at Connecticut Explored. Um, today's program We'll be touching on the life and career of Gideon Wells, and we're really glad to have you all here. A couple things that I wanted to mention. Um, first of all, you do have surveys on your chairs that we're going to ask you to fill out and hand to one of the staff members before you leave. And the other uh, thing I'd like to mention is that you will have an opportunity, if you would like, to purchase the book, a signed copy, in uh, the gift shop across the hall after our program. So without further ado, let's get into our program for today. And uh, I think you're going to enjoy this uh, discussion. I'm pleased to introduce my colleague over at the Connecticut Network, Diane Smith, who will be moderating today's program. Thank you. And as always, this program will be available on the air on CTN and online at ct-n.com. So we're very happy to have you here with us, and you can let your friends know uh, that they can also check it out later. So raise your hands. How many of you people keep a diary? Okay, a couple. How many of you journal? Okay, another couple. Um, how many of you blog? Nobody's blogging yet? Not even you, Matt? <laughs> well, I have to tell you that a study from Technorati in 2008 counted more than 185 million blogs online with 175,000 new blogs every day. That's approximately one every two seconds that's going online. So it shows that people do want to get their thoughts out there and that they do want their thoughts recorded. In 2013, a marketing study showed that even though there are so many outlets for teenagers and others to record and reveal their thoughts via Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, all those various uh, methods, 83% of girls aged 16 to 19 keep a diary. And that number increased among Generation Y as opposed to Generation X. So, okay, what's the value of keeping a diary? In some cases, the reasons are cathartic, to allow a writer to release emotions in a safe space. In some cases, they're creative, to try out ideas, um, store them, and think about them later, something that might be turned into something else later outside of a diary. And then there's the idea of creating a permanent record for posterity. Those diaries or journals have helped shape what we know of history. So here we are, just before Lincoln's birthday, and we're able to eavesdrop on some of the central moments of his administration, thanks to the extraordinary diary kept by Gideon Wells. A native of Glastonbury, Gideon Wells was a politician and a journalist. He was tapped by President Abraham Lincoln to serve as his Secretary of the Navy, and is regarded as an architect of the Union victory in the Civil War. All the while, he kept a vivid and pointed diary. J. Ronald Spencer, our speaker today, has edited that diary, choosing some of the key passages and organizing them by topic. The result is his book, A Connecticut Yankee in Lincoln's Cabinet. Professor Spencer taught courses in the Civil War era at Trinity College for 42 years. He is renowned for his deep knowledge of the Civil War. Please welcome J. Ronald Spencer. Thank you, Diane. Uh, I uh, appreciate the generous introduction and uh, admire the, um, what was Diane's word, the intrepid character of those who came out through the slush and snow uh, for this event. Um, as Diane has, uh, <coughs> excuse me, has said, uh, Wells uh, was uh, uh, a leading politician and journalist in uh, Connecticut. Uh, going back into the 1820s when he was an ardent admirer of Andrew Jackson. He uh, helped to uh, organize the Democratic Party in the state. He uh, edited the uh, partisan Democratic newspaper, the Hartford Times, from 1926, uh, 1826 rather, sorry, 
1837. He continued to write for it periodically uh, into the early 1850s. And uh, he held a number of offices, both elective and appointive. And uh, on the fifth, uh, I should also mention that he uh, uh, was one of the founders of the Republican Party uh, in Connecticut in 1856. So he had two different parties uh, that he had a hand in founding here in the state. And uh, on the 5th of March, 1861, the day after Lincoln was inaugurated, Wells took office as Secretary of the Navy, a post he held through the end of Andrew Johnson's administration. So he was Secretary of the Navy for eight years. No one before him had held that position uh, for such a long period of time. Wells began his diary in uh, August of 1862, continued it until he left office on March 4th, 1869, and uh, wrote the final entry on June 6th, five weeks after he and his wife had returned to Hartford. In 1911, 33 years after Wells' death, the entire diary was published in three stout volumes. Volume one and nearly half of volume two deal with the wartime years and the Lincoln administration, a total of 843 pages. And of those 843 pages, 776 were actual diary entries. That is to say, accounts of events, conversations, observations, ruminations, etc., that Wells recorded at or near the time they occurred, and which thus had uh, an immediacy that uh, memoirs tend not to have, and because he recorded these events and thoughts soon after they occurred, they are not colored, some might say distorted, by historical hindsight. The other 67 pages of that massive three-volume uh, edition uh, was an introductory event about events, uh, an introductory essay, rather, about events in uh, 1861 and early 1862. Uh, Wells wrote that long after uh, the events occurred, wrote it sometime in the 1870s, and thus it is not part of the actual diary. Now, in this talk, I want to provide you with something of an overview of the diary to quote selected passages that convey something of the diary's flavor and um, also uh, to make some evaluative comments about the reliability uh, and, uh, uh, of the uh, diary. And here I should mention, before going any farther, that after leaving office in 1869, Wells, between then and his death in 1878, went back and made substantial revisions in the diary. And those revisions made it less of a diary uh, if you look at that particular version of it. And uh, perhaps we'll have time during the discussion uh, to discuss the uh, problematic nature of those revisions. But uh, we'll come to that uh, in time, not in, not in this presentation right now. now there were three diarists in Lincoln's cabinet. The other two were Treasury Secretary Salmon P. Chase and Attorney General uh, Edward Bates. Their diaries are certainly important historical documents, but they are not on a par with Wells's diary. His entries are generally more interesting and perceptive than theirs, and he made many more entries than they did a total of 565 entries between the time he started the diary um, in uh, uh, August of 1862 and the end of the war. There were about 1,020 days in that period, so he was making a lot of entries, doing it often, uh, do the arithmetic. Some entries consist of combination of fact and opinion. Some entries are as short as a few sentences, but most are considerably longer. And as you might expect from someone of Wells's journalistic background, the prose is clear, 
crisp, and often has a nice polemical edge to it. Now, managing the naval war made enormous demands on Wells's time. And so it is not surprising to find him mentioning in one entry that he usually worked on the diary, quote, at a late evening hour after company has gone and the other labors of the day are laid aside. Probably the main reason he kept the diary so faithfully and so regularly was that he found it relaxing, an opportunity to temporarily escape from the cares of office and occasionally to vent a little. Now the diary covers an astonishingly large and diverse array of topics, running the gamut from the minor to the momentous. A few examples, intense rivalries among cabinet members, the attempt by a group of Republican senators to force Lincoln to oust Secretary of State William Seward, wartime infringements of civil liberties, rumors of sexual improprieties at the Treasury Department, a cabinet debate about whether West Virginia should be admitted to the Union, home state pressures on Wells to establish a new Navy Yard down in New London, controversy over what sort of music the Marine Band should play, which came under, of course, Wells' jurisdiction during their free summer concerts at Lafayette Park in Washington. The, uh, the, uh, the prosecution, rather, of civilian contractors for defrauding the Navy. A Russian fleet's visit, a kind of courtesy visit, to Washington. The sinking of the notorious Confederate commerce raider, Alabama. The massacre of black troops at Fort Pillow in Tennessee. The 1864 presidential election. And the death of Lincoln about which Wells wrote a very moving, emotion-charged diary account. Now, almost everything in the diary interests historians, but they have found two aspects or two elements of the diary especially valuable. The first is Wells' candid characterizations of cabinet colleagues, senior army and navy officers, and sundry other prominent figures, largely political figures. Characterizations that are usually caustic, often insightful, almost always fascinating to read, but sometimes inaccurate or unfair. Consider, for instance, what Wells had to say about Secretary of State Seward. There is considerable truth, I think, in his portrayal of Seward as, quote, often wanting in true wisdom as, quote, not particularly scrupulous, as, quote, a busybody by nature, as heedless of, quote, constitutional and legal restraints, and as prone to putting expediency ahead of principle, something that uh, Wells found intolerable. But I think Wells exaggerated Seward's propensity to appease the British government when disputes arose between Great Britain and the United States. And I think Wells never quite appreciated Seward's skillful maneuvering to prevent Great Britain from recognizing Confederate independence and perhaps even intervening militarily on behalf of the rebels. Wells also had harsh things to say about Secretary of the Treasury Chase, even though, oddly enough, at the 1860 Republican National Convention, Wells had voted for Chase and against Lincoln on all three ballots. I think perhaps the most classic comment, and one that was spot on right, was Wells's remark that Chase has, and I quote, inordinate ambition, intense selfishness, and insufferable vanity. You may have heard the, uh, the old story, I think it was Benjamin Wade, a senator from Ohio, Ohio was also Chase's state, who said Chase is a good man but he's unsound theologically. He thinks there should be four members of the Godhead, not three. <laughs> now, in various entries characterizing Secretary of, of War Stanton, Wells deployed such adjectives as mercurial, impulsive, 
vain, violent, intolerant, domineering, impatient, and tyrannical. And all of those things, the brusque, hard-driving Wells, I'd rather Stanton surely was. The Wells was also very adept at sizing up various military leaders. His analysis of George McClellan was particularly astute, and I want to quote it. He, meaning McClellan, is an intelligent engineer. Remember, that's what West Point was basically, an engineering training school, but not a commander. To attack or advance with energy and power is not in his reading or studies, nor is it in his nature or disposition to advance. He likes show, parade, and power. He wishes to outgeneral the rebels, but not to kill or destroy them. I think that's essentially as good a summary of McClellan's failings as you're going to find at least among his contemporaries, with the possible exception of Lincoln himself. He was also critical of a number of, of uh, senior naval officers, uh, as well as other uh, senior uh, army leaders. I don't have time to go into all of that, but I will say that on occasion he was capable, that is, Wells was capable, of praising people and doing so pretty much straightforwardly and unambiguously. And the best example is his remarks about uh, Admiral uh, David Farragut. And uh, he said of, of him that his greatness lay in the fact that he was, and I quote now, willing to take great risks in order to attain great results. And of course, the two uh, Civil War uh, campaigns and victories um, of uh, uh, Farragut that we, we know, his taking of, April, uh, taking of New Orleans in April of 1862, and his capture of Mobile Bay in August of 1864, those were really very risky, daring operations. Uh, and only someone of Farragut's audacity and self-confidence and resourcefulness could, I think, have succeeded in those campaigns. There isn't time to sample, though I'd like to do it, some of the things that Wells had to say about members of Congress, uh, about certain uh, newspaper editors, and sundry other folk. But I can't resist mentioning that he dubbed Horatio Seymour, the Democratic governor of New York, Sir Forcible Feeble for his feckless hand handling of the 1863 New York City draft riots. Now, historians value the diary even more for the abundant material it contains on Lincoln. And Wells identified numerous uh, of Lincoln's strengths, of his characteristics, that subsequent generations of historians have also attributed to him. Traits such as intelligence, common sense, political sagacity, skill in judging other people, kind-heartedness, readiness to admit mistakes, and to accept responsibility. He also recognized that Lincoln was a superior military strategist in his thinking than was the longtime general in chief, Henry Halleck. But I think apart from these observations about Lincoln, which have certainly influenced many historians' interpretation of Lincoln the man and Lincoln the president, probably the single most important contribution Wells made to our knowledge of Lincoln was that he quoted or paraphrased in his diary many things that Lincoln said in cabinet meetings or in private conversation. And if they had not been recorded in the diary, they probably would have been lost to posterity. Let me give you just a couple of examples in the time that remains. And here I should preface this part of my remarks by saying that usually, not invariably, but usually, Wells recorded Lincoln's remarks soon after hearing them, within a day or so, they presumably were still fresh in his memory, and thus their accuracy, presumably, is pretty good. 
Yeah, he may have gotten, in direct quotes, may have gotten a word or two wrong, but basically, you know, we can, we can trust his paraphrases and uh, his quotations from Lincoln. Cite one example. In his very first diary entry, Wells wrote that during a carriage ride to the funeral of Secretary of War Stanton's infant son, Lincoln confided to Seward and him that he contemplated issuing a proclamation emancipating the slaves in the rebel states. According to Wells, he, quote, dwelt earnestly on the gravity, importance, and delicacy of the movement, said he had given it much thought, and had about come to the conclusion that we must free the slaves or be ourselves subdued. Of course, this marked an important shift in Lincoln's position. Up to that time, he had rejected calls for general emancipation. On July 22nd, uh, just uh, nine days later, um, Lincoln read, uh, informed the entire cabinet, and read them a uh, draft of the proclamation and told them that he was going to defer issuing it pending a battlefield victory. And of course, he got that victory uh, with uh, the repulse of Lee at Antietam on the 22nd of September. And earlier that day, before issuing the preliminary proclamation, Lincoln held a cabinet meeting told the cabinet, said, I don't want your opinion whether to do this. I've decided that. But I want to make sure I've got the wording right, so I want you to you know, critique the draft. And uh, Wells' entry on that meeting quotes Lincoln as having said in the course of the meeting that, quote, he had made a vow, a covenant, that if God gave us the victory in the approaching battle, he would consider it an indication of divine will and that it was his duty to move forward in the cause of emancipation. God had decided the question in favor of the slaves." Unquote. Time being short, I'll limit myself to just one other uh, aspect of uh, uh, Lincoln uh, Lincoln's words being recorded by uh, Wells. We need, historians are always curious about Lincoln's views of senior military people. And we often turn to the diary because it has considerable material on that. For example, in a September 1862 entry, Wells recorded Lincoln's comment that McClellan, listen carefully, you'll see a very familiar phrase in what I'm about to quote, he recorded Lincoln's comment that McClellan, quote, can be trusted to act on the defensive, but having the slows, you've probably heard that attributed to um, McClellan, but having the slows, he is good for nothing for an onward movement. Wells was also greatly distressed. I'm sorry, <laughs> mine was wandering there. Lincoln was very distressed, and Wells recorded that fact when in 1863, General Meade, commander of the Army of the Potomac, failed to follow up his victory at Gettysburg by attacking and perhaps crushing Lee's retreating army, which was very vulnerable because the upper Potomac River was rain swollen and thus it prevented Lee and his army from uh, uh, getting back to the relative safety of Virginia. When Lincoln heard that the river had finally fallen enough for Lee to escape without Meade having ever launched an attack. He said to Wells, as they walked across the White House lawn, there is bad faith somewhere. Meade has been pressed and urged, but only one of his generals was for an immediate attack, was ready to pounce on Lee. The rest held back. What does it mean, Mr. Wells? Great God, what does it mean? Now, closing thought before someone with a hook grabs me and hauls me off. I would say in summary that Wells' characterization of many of his contemporaries, his insightful, if occasionally mistaken, observations about Lincoln, 
his preservation for posterity of many things Lincoln said, and the multitude of other topics he treated, all of these things served to make the diary a treasure trove for both historians and Civil War buffs, past, present, and presumably future. By maintaining the diary so conscientiously and by filling it with such rich content, Wells performed a great service to history. And in the process, he attained a certain measure of immortality. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Will you uh, join us on the, yes. on the stage here? I'll be happy to do it. I'll be happy to do it. Uh, Matt and Paula come up, too. That would be great. Um, we're going to have a bit of a discussion here among our panelists. And I encourage any of you who would like to get into it, whether you want to ask a question or whether you want to uh, make a comment, uh, please just raise your hand, and Rebecca will come to you with a microphone uh, so that we can hear what you're saying. And um, we're glad to have it. Um, very interesting that um, we have today, besides um, two professional historians, uh, we have Paula Hopewell. And Paula uh, makes a note that she is not a professional historian. She calls herself rather a Lincoln aficionado, which I thought was nice. Uh, Paula joined the Lincoln Forum in 2010, which holds annual meetings in November in Gettysburg. Paula is a member of the Civil War Roundtable of Fairfield County and the Lincoln Group of New York. In her hometown of Brookfield, Paula works at the polls on Election Day, and she has been able to research the voting records of Connecticut from 1860 and 1864, which we'll talk about a little bit later because they're very revealing. Also joining us is Dr. Matt Warth Warshower. Thank you, Matt, for being with us. He is, as some of you know, professor of history at Central Connecticut. Connecticut State University. He wrote Connecticut in the American Civil War, Slavery, Sacrifice, and Survival. Dr. Warshower is the co-chair of the Connecticut Civil War Commemoration Commission and has been helping coordinate activities across the state to focus on the importance and the lasting legacies of the American Civil War and Connecticut's involvement in it. Matt has also got a new project. He is producing a Lincoln assassination play, which will take place in April at the University of St. Joseph. Do we have a date yet, Matt? Uh, the actual opening night will be April 14th, which is on the night that Lincoln was shot. Well, that is, um, that's fascinating. Yeah. And actually it ties in. And then in. there'll be 17th and 18th, the Friday and Saturday. So there's three shows total. And okay. it is uh, guaranteed to rivet people. And it's, it's at the University of St. Joseph. It's at the University of St. Joseph. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, that ties in perfectly with what I wanted to just read here, a short excerpt from a Connecticut Yankee in Lincoln's cabinet, Gideon Wells' diary, because um, Ron, as you mentioned, um, he was, had a background as a journalist, and I think that that comes, really comes, becomes clear in this particular very short excerpt, and this is on the night that Lincoln lay dying, and um, uh, the Navy secretary was at the house and at the bedside of the president. And he writes, a little before seven, I went into the room where the dying president was rapidly drawing near the closing moments. His wife soon after made her last visit to him. The death struggle had begun. Robert, his son, stood at the head of the bed. He bore himself well, but on two occasions gave way to overpowering grief and sobbed aloud, turning his head and leaning on the shoulder of Senator Sumner. The respiration of the president became suspended at intervals and at last entirely ceased at 22 minutes past seven. That sounds like not only a diarist, but a journalist writing that to me, and I think that's quite quite moving. So let's talk a little bit about this diary. And, um, Matt, I want to start with you because not that long ago we had a program here where we discussed how memory affects history. And I would say that as we're looking at a diary and then an edited diary, that has to have a big impact on how we see history so many years later. Well, I, I think Ron <laughs> encapsulated it uh, really quite expertly, and that is when you're looking at, at diaries, uh, you, you always have to wonder about the objectivity or the subjectivity of, of the author. And, uh, and we historians do this with all diaries that they look at, and, and also many letters. Was it meant to be seen by others, or was it just for their own private, you know, is, it, this is what you made me think of this when you asked about blogging mm -hmm. at the very opening, is that bloggers are meant, you know, they're putting it out there for right. everyone to see. Uh, would you have the same, would you say the same thing in a blog? that you would in your private journal. Mm 
that you weren't intending anybody to read or perhaps intending for somebody to read long after you've passed. And so that really has an impact mm -hmm. on how we view the information. It doesn't make it less valuable. Mm -hmm. It just, we have to go into it with that mindset. Uh, the same is very, very true. I'm, I'm in the process of reading a brand new book that came out on the Connecticut 16th Regiment. Mm -hmm. And what one of the things that the author uh, said is that you really have to look at regimental histories with a special eye mm -hmm. because they're often written well after the regiment's experiences and they view them in sort of a little bit, they, yeah. they, they reminisce <laughs> about what it is they've done in the past and all of that colors our perceptions today. Matt, I agree with your point about whether someone else is meant to see it, but in this age of too much information, I would suggest that a lot of blogs put everything out there and there's nothing safe for the private. Uh, it's true. I, I warn my daughters about that very point when it comes to Facebook. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Paul, I want to ask you a question, and that is um, you're not a, uh, a professional historian, as you, as you mentioned, but you have done a lot of research um, into President Lincoln. Why is that and what is it that continues to make him so fascinating to so many people? And if you would mention the number of books that have been written about him. The number of books is somewhere in the vicinity of 16,000, more than any other figure in history with the exception of Jesus Christ, as I understand it. And that's not um, even including Civil War books. Mm -hmm. That's books that are just focused about around Lincoln. Right. Mm -hmm. I think the Civil War total is more like 45 or 46,000 mm -hmm. books. Mm -hmm. Uh, what fascinates us about Lincoln, um, to me, I guess he's just the mythic American. Mm -hmm. uh, Lincoln made a statement. Um, he didn't say if I could be president, anyone could be president. He said if my father's son could be president, anyone could be president. That's very telling because he came from such a, a hard, scrabble, kind of deprived mm -hmm. uh, background even by those standards of mm -hmm. his day and look what he accomplished, look what he accomplished. And it wasn't just that we won the war because he had an iron fist. Mm -hmm. This man, uh, the thing I admire about him the most is his compassion. Mm -hmm. um, people admire his, his logical skills, his speeches, his writing. Um, he never lost his touch with the common man. Mm -hmm. He loved to tell jokes and stories, and I'll entertain you with some of those later if you'd like, but I, I think um, for everybody, it's probably a slightly different answer. Mm -hmm. Ron, you but, talked about the revision um, of the diary and how it's problematic, and um, it, it occurs to me that there are a lot of particular problems with that, and I wondered, what was the motivation for revising it? Was it because his, some of his comments were so caustic? Was he trying to soften that, or? That's, that's a very good question. And there's very little evidence that that was his motive, mm -hmm. that he wanted to, to uh, temper what uh, Robert Todd Lincoln called his fierce judgments. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of that, but not very much. And insofar as, they, as there was a tempering, it was more done by his son, mm -hmm. who was involved, his eldest son, uh, Edgar, who was involved in uh, putting the, the diary together for publication in, in 1911. No, I, I think more what his concern was, uh, well, some things were very simple. He was a terrible speller. Uh, he spelled General Halleck's name, which ends E-C-K, O-C-K for about half the war before he got it right, and even then sometimes he slipped back. Uh -huh. So some of the changes are things like that, mm -hmm. correcting misspelling, uh, fiddling with the punctuation and so forth. And I don't think anyone is too much troubled mm -hmm. by that. Uh, in some cases, he, he realized that he had referred uh, or alluded to groups, uh, small groups of, of people, uh, and now he but hadn't named them, and so he puts in the names. And if you assume his memory was good, then that's probably a useful addition. But what gets problematic is when he revises an entry so as to alter the impression or the feeling or the perception that he had had of the individual mm -hmm. at the time he wrote it. And thus, for example, uh, he wrote originally, this is a minor example, but it illustrates the point. Uh, at one point, he, he, he wrote originally that Lincoln was sometimes um, uh, duped by uh, schemers and dishonest people. Mm -hmm. uh, sometime in the 70s, when of course by this time Lincoln was both a martyr and a kind of demigod in the American, uh, or at least uh, north of, of uh, the, the Confederacy he was. And uh, so he, inserted 
sometimes but not often do. Okay. <laughs> That's a, it's a small yeah. thing. Uh, if I can give one other example, and this doesn't involve Lincoln, it involves rather Grant. Um, and uh, Wells had a pretty good uh, opinion of Ulysses S. Grant uh, down through the end of the war. Mm -hmm. Had some misgivings, but basically uh, well disposed toward it. But during the Reconstruction period, uh, Wells had a falling out with Grant because he thought Grant uh, had, had uh, uh, sold out President Johnson uh, uh, for the support of, of radical Republicans. And so uh, when he was doing revisions of the diary after leaving office, he softened his praise of, of uh, 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 Grant very noticeably, or changed it, mm -hmm. uh, weakened it, I guess you would say. And then to give just one small example, uh, on April 7 of 1865, just a couple of days before um, um, Lee surrendered to Grant, um, Wells wrote, and I'm quoting this from memory, I think I have it about right, that in closing up this war, Grant has shown military talent and genius. When he revised it in the 70s, when he no longer had such a good opinion of Grant, he said, in winding up this war, Grant has shown military talent. But then he goes on and says, but he is slow and lacks genius. Hmm. That's a dramatic. Yeah, that's a pretty dramatic pretty change. Dramatic. So does that, that get yeah. at your question? Yeah. Matt, I want to talk a little bit about um, something that Ron uh, addressed just very briefly in the beginning, which was um, how Gideon Wells comes into the Republican Party and why uh, Abraham Lincoln chooses him as his naval secretary. Well, as Ron had said, uh, Wells is a diehard Jacksonian. Uh, and when you look, uh, when you go a little bit further back and you look at the development of the Second American Party system, in any given state, uh, what it really comes down to is often a single person or group of people who act as organizers, and one of the first things they want to do is, state, is create a state party organ. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what Wells does. He creates the Hartford Times. It's a democratic Jacksonian mouthpiece. As a result of that, he becomes very influential and rises up uh, in democratic politics mm -hmm. in Connecticut. And so as you know, you, you of course ask the, the, the biggest question when it comes to the, the, the history of the Civil War causation, and that's what happens with political parties. Uh, in the 1840s, we start to undergo all kinds of problems in relation to the westward expansion of slavery, mm -hmm. to the extent that, uh, for that and other reasons, the Democratic and the Whig parties uh, start to have difficulties internally. Mm -hmm. And I think that the historian Michael Holt really gets it best when he says these parties begin to disintegrate. Mm -hmm. It's not that the slavery issue <clears throat> destroys them, it's that other things are going on along with the slavery mm -hmm. issue and the, the parties start to, to, to come loose from their rails. Mm -hmm. And this is certainly what is happening to the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have the free soil movement, which is not an anti-slavery movement, it's an anti-slavery moving west movement. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, I mean, it's a, it's a distinction, mm -hmm. but it's an important distinction. And Wells is falling within, within that mm -hmm. a bit. And when he starts to see that the Northern Democratic Party is really being impacted by the Southern members of the, of the Democratic Party, he and a number of others start to look for something else. And it's not as though uh, he suddenly jumps ship quickly. Mm -hmm. Very, very few people in their, you know, political parties, you tend to be, you know, tightly connected mm -hmm. to a political party during the anti Pelham years. And so Wells doesn't jump ship. Uh, for yeah. lack of a better metaphor. We got it. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't do that on purpose, really. Um, he doesn't dump, jump ship quickly. This happens over a period of time mm -hmm. until the Northern Democratic Party just, it doesn't look viable. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he ultimately leaves that party. He and like many others are in a, in a bit of a limbo period mm -hmm. yeah. when ultimately the Republican Party starts to become formed. Uh, and in different, it occurs in different times in different states. Mm -hmm. And when, uh, but as he had done with the Democratic Party, Wells is is so well respected and so well connected, it's not surprising to historians at all that he ends up being one of the leaders for the organization of the Republican Party mm -hmm. in Connecticut.
Paula, I wanted to talk to you about a point that um, you and I discussed earlier, which is uh, something that Matt has talked about quite a bit in, in his lectures and in his book and on his book tour, which is that the Civil War, particularly as it was viewed in Connecticut, or let me just say maybe not particularly, but specifically as it was viewed in Connecticut, was not just a simple clash of right versus wrong, slavery versus you know non-slavery, North versus South, that there was a lot more texture and, and, and depth to this. Yes, it was very messy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one point I like to bring out uh, in my lectures is that I live in Brookfield, Connecticut, which is the home of one of the few remaining copperhead flags that we discovered in someone's home about 15, 20 years ago. The copperheads were uh, peace Democrats who opposed Lincoln's conduct of the war. They opposed the war, and um, at the time, I learned about this flag. I did not know or have access to the um, Connecticut election mm -hmm. results. Mm -hmm. And I did get my hands on those. And since I'm a mathematician by training, I'm yeah. grinding out all these numbers. Well, not only did my own Brookfield vote against Mr. Lincoln's uh, re-election, mm -hmm. my neighbors in Newtown, Bridgewater, New Fairfield, and uh, 40% of the Connecticut towns overall in 1864 mm -hmm. voted against Lincoln's re-election, which I think is a fact that mm -hmm. isn't especially well known. Mm -hmm. Probably not. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I wanted to ask you, Paula, is that, um, and, and Matt has said this um, so frequently, that there was a real um, pervasive anti-war feeling in maybe in certain pockets. I, I think, Matt, that one of your graduate students wrote about these certain pockets that were very much anti-war. So Paul, why don't you talk about that for a second, and then I'll let Matt follow that up. Um, I'm trying to remember all these numbers. I just told you I crunched. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, Wyndham and Tallinn mm -hmm. counties were the most favorable mm -hmm. toward Lincoln. Mm -hmm. um, Litchfield and Fairfield were much yes. less supportive. Fair, Fairfield County uh, stood out as mm -hmm. being a particularly uh, strong against Lincoln. Um, I did want to mention, I forgot to before, uh, in 1860, the first election, um, Lincoln's party as Matt pointed out, um, it wasn't necessarily to stop slavery in its, mm -hmm. well, stop it in its tracks, meaning not to let it expand, but mm -hmm. Lincoln was not advocating that slavery be abolished. Now, what I was interested in is that about 40% of Connecticut voters voted for the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. um, and these consisted of both Northern Democrats and Southern Democrats, all of whom favored the expansion of slavery. They just had different terms under mm -hmm. which they would allow that. So to my modern, perhaps naive view, because I keep pointing out I was not a professional historian, but I was very surprised mm -hmm. to learn that 40% of Connecticut voters would have favored a Democratic candidate. And Matt, um, you know, we like to believe here, and I guess it's been somewhat of a myth over the years, that Connecticut was very strongly anti-slavery, pro, you know, uh, the war, pro-Lincoln, not, and really your research showed in your book, not really the case. No, it's not the case. And, and it's, it's difficult to say, oh, we were really abolitionist, or no, we were really opposed mm -hmm. to abolition. It, it doesn't break down quite that simply. Mm -hmm. And this is when uh, it becomes that much more important to look at individual areas of Connecticut, even as small a state as we are, mm -hmm. and you have a lot of Connecticut history mm -hmm. professionals here today. We know when you look at different areas of Connecticut, you get extremely unique stories. And mm -hmm. so to paint Connecticut with uh, a broad brush, uh, I think even today doesn't always work so well. Mm -hmm. And uh, what Paula has done with crunching those numbers <clears throat> on the elections for Lincoln and looking at all of the individual towns and how they voted mm -hmm. is actually really, really important mm -hmm. for us to, to have a little bit more of an understanding of what areas were Copperhead, what areas were pro-Lincoln, anti-Lincoln. And I I'm, was really happy to see that uh, Wyndham County shows that it is very pro-Lincoln. And in fact, you had mentioned one of my graduate mm -hmm. students did her master's thesis on this. Mm -hmm. And she actually took my premise that much of Connecticut was largely anti-abolitionist and, um, and, and not supportive of the war, at least big sections of it. Mm -hmm. And as exactly what we want our graduate students to do is destroy our, as professors, own arguments. And she did quite a good job <laughs> of that, of going, no, 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 no. You were absolutely wrong about Wyndham County. And she explains why. And so it's great to hear the voting numbers back up what mm -hmm. her ideas about mm -hmm. that were. Mm -hmm. And yet, even so, I think it was a fourth of the Wyndham County towns and a third of the votes 
were against Lincoln. Mm -hmm. So even in an area that was a stronghold, mm -hmm. it's it's not as if it were 100% yeah, Things rarely clear. come down to yeah. right. one or two yeah. issues. Right. So much Professor more Spencer, yeah. I, I, I think uh, what they've said is quite, quite correct. But I think you, you get the best measure of anti-war support in the uh, April 1863 gubernatorial election. Connecticut, believe it or not, had a gubernatorial election annually in April every year. Those and of us that just lived through the last one cannot <laughs> yeah, even imagine. That's the reason why I mentioned it. Whenever I mention this, everybody in the audience always goes, oh, uh, yeah, exactly. shakes their head. But uh, yeah. to, to get to the point, uh, uh, a man named Thomas Seymour, uh, who was a very outspoken copperhead, um, ran on the Democratic ticket versus the incumbent uh, war governor, uh, William uh, Buckingham. And uh, he, uh, he lost, that is, Seymour lost, by about 3,000 votes. But he got about 48 and a fraction percent. So it was a very close race. And, it, and this presented real problems for Wells, because Wells, going back to his days as a Jacksonian Democrat, wanted to believe that the mass of people, given proper you know, opportunity to learn some facts and so forth, would do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, and I, I quote this uh, um, in, in the book uh, from the diary, you know, he says, well, then before, even before the election occurred, he said, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to vote for Seymour without, I'm paraphrasing now, without subscribing to his anti-war and perhaps treasonable views, but simply because they're Democrats and he's a Democratic candidate. And so, and that points up in a day when at least people pretend to be independent-minded, mm -hmm. in, independent-minded when they go to the, to the polls that party allegiances were almost as intense, and for some people maybe even more intense, than religious allegiances were. And just as a, a Methodist would no sooner not be a Methodist uh, than a, a Democrat or a Republican, even if they ran the proverbial yellow dog, mm -hmm. got voted for. So to some extent, the fact that, that uh, uh, Seymour came so close to winning the governorship mm -hmm doesn't necessarily mean that nearly half of Connecticut voters were anti-war, anti-Lincoln, pro-Confederate. Mm -hmm. Many were probably just being partisan Democrats. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does anyone have a question or a remark they'd like to make? We'd be happy to take any remarks from the audience. Just raise your hand, wave it around, let me see you. Um, OK, you can stop us at any point if you'd like to. I think that um, one of the things that I've learned a lot um, being on the commission with Matt is really how complex this whole situation uh, really was, that it really wasn't black and white, which is, I think, how I saw it um, prior to this. And Professor, it sounds as though your research over the years has really borne that out as well, not just in Connecticut, but elsewhere. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't think that probably, and here we'll, I'll date myself and the rest, but I suspect um, there's not an undergraduate today who has taken a course, a serious course on the Civil War and hasn't slept all the way through it, who could, could subscribe to notions that I was fed uh, when I was a, a youth um, about you know, the noble North and the sinful South, mm -hmm. about uh, this was strictly a, a clash between abolitionism mm -hmm. and pro-slaveryism um, and so forth. So uh, in a way, I think this, what's called a revisionist view of things, which, among other virtues, captures a much greater complexity of mm -hmm. political views, of social uh, groups, and so forth. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm reluctant to say that there's pro progress in history. I'm always a little skeptical about that. But here, I think there was a little progress mm -hmm. in history that's occurred over the last mm -hmm. 25, 30 years, maybe even 40 years mm -hmm. now, going back to the early days of Kenneth Stamp and so forth. Matt, I want to talk a little bit more about um, Gideon Wells as a member of this cabinet. Even for people that have not read Doris Kearns Goodwin's book, they probably have heard bandied about that phrase and the title, you know, a, a team of rivals. Yeah. So how does he fit into that whole picture? Uh, Wells fits into that picture perfectly because he is a uh, former Democrat. You know, remember, and again, going back to what I had said before, the Republican Party is if you will, a conglomerate party. It's made up of former Whigs, 
Uh, it's made up of former Northern Democrats, those who have left either of those parties to go into the Free Soil Party. Then you've got Know Nothing Party, which is anti-immigrant. So there's all these different elements. And Lincoln has to create a cabinet that is going to balance those various elements. Because we can't, you know, we, we would like to think that all of our politicians make decisions based on great ideological principles. But their ideological principles are going to get them absolutely nowhere if they don't know how to manage power. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that Lincoln proves very adept at. And Wells fits into this perfectly because he's a former Democratic, mm -hmm. not just a former Democrat, but a former Democratic leader. He's from New England, so Lincoln has to think about not only past party affiliations, but he has to think about geographic mm -hmm. affiliations as well. Uh, Wells is very well thought of throughout the Northeast, and the first time that uh, Lincoln comes to Connecticut to, uh, to campaign actually on behalf of, of the then uh, Governor Buckingham who was up for re-election, mm -hmm. that's when he meets Wells for the first time and then gets recommendations from other New Englanders of this is a good guy for you to have in your cabinet. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, what Paula was saying about her admiration for Lincoln, you know, I've taught uh, the Age of Lincoln course, which I'm teaching now at CCSU. I've taught it a few times, and I think one of the things that strikes me most about Lincoln is not just his, his ability for leadership and his compassion, and he did most definitely had compassion, was, but his ability to not be pig-headed in his decision making and his views. And I think it's one of the things that stands out most when you look at things he's done. And I think this is also interesting what, what Ron was talking about with Wells deciding to change things in his diary and how historians would look at this. And one of the ways we should look at it is that Wells, like all of us, was a human being. And human beings are complex, and we get mad one day and say something about someone, and then the next day we go, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> and if we've blogged it already, well then we're really in trouble. Right. And so at least he has the virtue of going back <laughs> and trying to, to address right. it, That's right? right? <laughs> but so I, I think he and Wells uh, became very close uh, and, and, and developed uh, a, a close friendship. And the thing, and, and Lincoln does that with Secretary of State Seward, too, which is probably his greatest rival in the cabinet, and absolutely thought that, I mean, he literally thought Lincoln was an imbecile mm -hmm. when he first came into office. And by the end of uh, the, you know, Lincoln's administration, when, by the time he, he dies, uh, the two are extremely close. Mm -hmm. So much so that, and this is one of the things that amazed me when I was working on the, the script for the Lincoln assassination play, is that Seward at one point says to, uh, to his daughter, uh, uh, or, or I think to Stanton rather, uh, says, uh, the president is dead. And he said, well, how do you know? And Seward simply says, because if he was alive, he would have come to see me by now. Yeah. Seward being laid up because he'd had bad carriage. Right, he had had a bad carriage accident. Right. Yeah. He, he would have yeah, come and seen me by now. And I yeah. think that's yeah. the compassionate yeah. aspect that you see with Lincoln. And I think, you know, for Wells to have been this, you know, staunch former Democrat, mm -hmm. to have developed this um, tremendous respect, but also, I think, a real love for Lincoln. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, someone, I think it was Margaret Leach, uh, remarked back in probably more than a half century ago, uh, a little bit of exaggeration in this, but this is what she said, that, that Lincoln could like Wells because he was the only member of the cabinet who didn't think he was a better man than Lincoln was. <laughs> <laughs> and then, I mean, certainly Stanton thought himself better, Chase thought himself better, I'm not so sure about Seward, right. uh, but there's, I say, there's some, some, some basic truth to that. Paula, one of the things that um, is revealed uh, in this diary is something of the personality of the president and how he did interact with not only his cabinet but with other people. Um, you said that uh, you, you have some stories and things that you like to share with people. Why don't you give us an example of one? Uh, I'm not sure I have a complete story, but I can sure. tell you a few jokes sure. that are attributed to Lincoln, um, one of which um, is something along the lines of, no matter how much cats fight, there never seems to be a shortage of kittens. <laughs> <laughs> and another one, um, he said to someone, well, if I were two-faced, would I be wearing this one? <laughs> I like that. Jeff. He had a sense of humor that just, it never left him. And there was a cabinet meeting, I think they were discussing the Emancipation Proclamation, and Lincoln had a little joke book, and he was sitting there 
you know, trying to take his mind off things, mm -hmm. I guess. And one of the cabinet members chided him, why in the world are you doing that? In the midst of a discussion like this, what is wrong with you? Mm -hmm. And Lincoln said something along the lines of, um, with the terrible strain that is upon me night and day, I need this relief. And by the way, gentlemen, so do you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't, that's not a uh, direct quote close. there, but I'm, I'm pretty close. That's one of the parts <laughs> I'm pretty in close. The, the movie Lincoln that I think yes. Spielberg mm -hmm. and Tony Kushner nailed so well they is did. when they're, they're in the war office and Lincoln says, well, that reminds me of a story. And everyone there goes, no, not right, another right. story. <laughs> Enough with the and joke. that really captures accurately what Lincoln was like. He had a very body sense of humor. Uh -huh. He did. If, if mm -hmm. I could add a, 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 just a footnote on this. Um, we think of Wells, with good reason, as rather austere and humorless, and I think he was. Yet, several times in the diary, he commends Lincoln on the skill with which he tells stories and recounts yeah. anecdotes, often to make some larger political mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. So uh, he's maybe, maybe there's a little touch of, of, of humor in Wells, after all. Mm -hmm. Small, and I it, it, It's a little bit of a contradiction in Lincoln's character that he uh, learned this storytelling yeah. largely from his father, mm -hmm. but actually he had very little regard for his father mm -hmm. and for everything I have to say about how compassionate Abraham Lincoln was and how soft-hearted uh, Lincoln's father was dying. He wrote to Lincoln and said, I want you to come see me. Lincoln refused to do it. Mm -hmm. He wrote a letter and said, um, it wouldn't do either one of us any good. Mm -hmm and he did not attend his own father's funeral. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of um, story about him, I guess, that hooks me mm -hmm. and maybe hooks some other people because that deep humanity is there. Mm -hmm. And footnote mm -hmm. to that, too. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't mean to take issue with you. What you say is substantially right. But he didn't write the letter to his father, who was illiterate. He wrote it to someone who stayed with his father and said, tell my father tell that I'm not coming, etc." So, so it's a, Interesting. Uh, it's so, and some people think, I think this is much oversimplified, but some people think that the reason why Lincoln had a very um, distant relationship with his father uh, was that he, he was contemptuous of him for never having tried to improve himself, mm -hmm. not even by learning how to you know, mm -hmm. read and write a bit. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I do want to um, talk just a little bit more, almost out of time, but I do want to talk a little bit, Matt, about um, what we should walk away with from this. I, I have to say that, um, Professor, I would never have picked up Gideon Wells' diaries. They're just way too overwhelming. Paula was reading them recently, and there is a stack about oh, this big, big, right? Yeah, that's but right. this is so easy to read because you have um, excerpted it, and you've also filed them under topics so that it can really go back and take a look and see. And it does feel like eavesdropping a little bit. Um, Matt, in, a, in, a, in a, a tome like this, what are we supposed to walk away with from this all these many years later? I think the great thing is that this, this adds a lot to where Connecticut has been for the commemoration overall. Mm -hmm. We have, as a, as a commission and as a historical community, uh, with you know, the magazine Connecticut Explored to so many other uh, uh, publications, uh, we have managed to do an outstanding job of researching and publishing, whether it's electronic form or in print, uh, of our state's history mm -hmm. during the Civil War. We've learned mm -hmm. more in the last four years than we've known in the last 150 years. Mm -hmm. And this book fits just perfectly in that because it connects to uh, an important Connecticut figure but makes it so incredibly accessible. Mm -hmm. there's, like, as you say, there's very few people who are going to pick up the 800 page tome and say, mm -hmm. you know, I think I'll do some light reading. Mm -hmm. And right. it's just not gonna happen. Yeah. But with this, you go, oh, you know, this is about our own history. Mm -hmm. it's, it's about our, our state here. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because when I uh, was talking with Ron before he was getting ready to publish this, I said, well, what are you gonna use for the cover? You should use the picture of the statue that's over the Capitol building. Uh -huh. it's, it's just, he said, I've already got it. <laughs> and so we, were, we, we had already, without even speaking yeah. of it, had been yeah. in tune with that yeah. because we know this history. I think that's what's really important mm -hmm. about this mm -hmm. volume. And, and you have um, many times referred to our Capitol building as being sort of an ode to the Civil War and to the sacrifice of the Civil War. And there's another question. example And, and we know that for a fact yeah. now. Uh, well, I'd always believed that it had a lot of Civil War tributes to it, but we've actually now gone and done the research, mm -hmm. and we know that there are 19 
uh, items related to the American Civil War in our state capitol building. That's more than any other capitol building mm -hmm. in the entire country. Mm -hmm. And that's significant. It shows you where our state was mm -hmm. in the late 1870s. Paul, I asked you to bring a prop today, and I would like you <laughs> yeah. to pick it up and show it to us. It is not the Lincoln <laughs> Chia Pet, although there apparently is such a thing. I received one for Christmas. You did. Chia okay. Lincoln, I did. Chia Lincoln, okay. <laughs> so you grow his beard, I guess, with I couldn't seeds? bring myself to do it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I re-gifted it elsewhere. <laughs> I just <laughs> couldn't do it. <laughs> and I really didn't know you wanted this on the show, but yeah. okay. This was another Christmas gift I received from my daughter, Laura. And Hold it in your other hand so it's closer to your microphone. Okay. If let you... North and South, let all Americans, let all lovers of liberty everywhere join in the great and good work. If we do this, we shall not only have saved the Union, but we shall have so saved it as to make and to keep it forever worth the saving. I think he has 25 things he says. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my mother's calling. I can't stand it. Tiny body jokes. That's the no. question. <laughs> no jokes. <laughs> He's pretty wants, serious. Yes. If anyone wants to examine that a little more closely when the program's <laughs> over, I'm sure Paula would allow that. I've Just lost all credit. Be very careful. <laughs> Not at all. No, I don't think so at all. I think we're all delighted with it. See, I could have brought my Andrew Jackson bobblehead. Uh, <laughs> mine doesn't, mine, Andrew Jackson doll doesn't speak, but if it did, its only utterance would be, by the eternal. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that does remind me of one of my other favorite Lincoln quotes, mm -hmm. which is, I laugh because I must not cry. Mm -hmm. I must not cry. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably part of the spirit that got him um, through as much of the war as it did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Professor, I'll let you have the last word on um, your thinking since you edited this huge diary into this um, much more user-friendly. Um, how has it kind of changed, if it has, how you think about uh, the Lincoln administration? Well, um, since I had read large parts of the diary. You did the light the reading. Of, you read the 800 yeah. pages. Of well, I, it's one of the things I was paid for. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I, I, I didn't find anything that was entirely new but I found some things that put a subject I thought I knew well in a different light. Mm -hmm. Somehow, when I first read it, it hadn't struck me as important. Um, a small example, if I may. Uh, it's a sign of just how shrewd an observer um, Wells was. About the 7th or 8th of September, McClellan was moving troops northward, running more or less parallel to Lee's movement northward. They finally clashed at Antietam Creek on the 17th of September. And as, as a big unit of them uh, marched through Washington, Wells noted that they had been put on a route where they would pass McClellan's house and thus would cheer for McClellan. Instead of, as had been, had been conventional, routed by the White House where they would give cheer for the president. And it's a kind of a classic example of the tension that existed between McClellan and Lincoln, ever going back to, the, to uh, earlier in the summer of 62 with the Peninsula Campaign and Lincoln finally saying, you're not making it, come on back to Washington, et cetera. And you know, it's the kind of thing that when I read it probably 15 years ago, it a, okay, but boy, it really whacked me this time. Mm -hmm. It's just a, one of those, what was Walter Cronkite used to say, among those who are my age in the audience, these are the events that lighten and illuminate our time. Well, this was an anecdote, an observation that very much enlightened and illuminated uh, the situation in Washington in the fall of 1862. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists for being here. Um, Professor Spencer, thank you so much for um, editing this wonderful book. Uh, Matt Warshower will look forward to the play on the Lincoln assassination, debuting at St. Joseph's on April 14th. And uh, Paula, thank you so much for being with us and uh, for giving us the non-professional historian's view, which most of us are not. So thank you so much, all three of you. And I want to thank you for being here.